So we have um, a large uh, group of countries that have been involved in the creation of Goa for quite a long time. In fact, this was an initiative that we started to work on with Denmark and Irina at COP26, and we had a meeting already then uh, with many of the countries that have since uh, become members of Goa. Uh, we have a large group of countries already um, formally signed up, so we have 10 countries already formally signed up. We are in last stage discussions with five or six more which are going through formal processes or there's been a change of government, but we would expect them to be signed up in the, in the coming uh, a few weeks. And then there's a very large amount of interest from other countries. Quite simply, the relevance of Goa is that it took us 20 or more years to develop uh, offshore wind in Europe and to build it to the scale it has. Now, with the climate targets we have and the energy targets we have, we cannot, spare, you know, we cannot afford to spend 20 or 30 or 40 years um, installing offshore wind in, in the rest of the world. And in fact, the targets have just grown more and more ambitious. Um, and part of the reasoning uh, behind Goa is that we, um, along with IRENA, submitted a compact to the United Nations uh, last September. That compact was for 380 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And at the time, many people thought that was a you know, hugely ambitious um, figure. Actually, now, a year later, pledges from governments are something like 370 gigawatts. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a time now to go and build and invest. Um, and we're hoping that Goa can play a really fundamental role um, in closing that implementation gap and allowing people to invest and build. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, our panelists this morning, um, starting with um, uh, Colombia's uh, Ministry of uh, Mines and Energy, um, um, Her Excellency Irene Vélez uh, Torres. Uh, it's fantastic to have Colombia, and Colombia's played a very proactive role in the, in the formation of Goa. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer uh, Morgan, State Secretary and Special um, Envoy for International Climate Action of Germany. Um, we have um, uh, the Dutch uh, Climate um, Envoy, His Royal Highness Prince uh, Jaime de Bourbon de Parma. Uh, we have um, the Norwegian Climate um, uh, Special Envoy for Climate and Security, Hans Olaf Ibrek. I hope I've said that uh, right, uh, Hans. Um, and we have um, the National Climate Advisor for the White House, um, uh, Mr. Ali Zaidi. Again, we're extremely excited to see how active the United States has been in this whole conversation. It's so great to have the US back in, you know, in the room and so proactive around this. And then finally, last but not, not least, um, uh, Mads Nipper, the CEO of Austere, which is the world's largest um, offshore wind uh, uh, developer. So it's great to have you all here. But what I'd like to do, first of all, is introduce our partners in uh, Goa. Um, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, it's actually the Director General of IRENA, Francesca Le Camera, to say a few words, and then uh, Thomas Anke Christensen, who's the Danish uh, Climate um, Ambassador. So over to you, um, Francesca, first of all. So thank you, Ben, and uh, I'm sure that you uh, understand that it's not by chance that we are launching Goa at the beginning of a COP that has been branded as an implementation COP. It is a reminder that uh, we have the solution to keep us on a climate safe, safe path in line with the 1.5 Celsius goal. We are starting to be a little bit late uh, concerning this goal, but we still able to stick to it. Today, renewables based electricity is the cheapest power option in most regions. Arena's latest costing report showed that electricity from newly commissioned offshore wind fell almost 50 percent between 2010 and 2020. That this makes uh, the launch of this alliance so exciting because offshore wind has enormous untapped potential to help us to make uh, the uh, Paris Achievement goal a reality. A reality. Arena estimates that offshore wind will be one of the fastest growing generation sources. By 2030, it could supply 24% of total power needs globally. Offshore winds bring positive socioeconomic impact thanks to its high potential for green job creation. It helps us advance a just transition. Collectively, we need to assemble a major building block for offshore winds from policy framework to financial de-risking instruments. And we must recognize that public-private collaboration is a key lever for accelerating deployment of offshore wind. And uh, this is where Goa come into play. 
we will bring together public and private sector actors across the offshore wind value chain. GOVA is funded with the ambition to create a global driving force for offshore winds through political mobilization and the creation of a global community of practice. Today marks a new beginning for offshore wind with a coalition of partners who can make the promise of this technology a tool for advancing the climate and development objective. Let me also say that it's a pleasure coming to this day today after I've been working with Ben, Thomas, and others to make this possible. Thank you very much. Thomas, please, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Francesco. And uh, thank you, friends, uh, partner countries, uh, to join us today for this very exciting launch. Um, before I make a few remarks, I just have to preface what I say by uh, stating that uh, we had elections in Denmark a week ago, and, and right now there is a caretaker government in Denmark which puts certain limits on what uh, we as government officials um, can do. But, but we decided, uh, the Danish uh, acting government decided to go forward with participating in this launch because it is of major importance to Denmark to do this. Um, and hence, we are very excited about the launch of this great project here today. Um, as Ben pointed out, the, uh, this is really about raising the, um, the ambition on, on offshore wind deployment. Uh, ben mentioned the figure of uh, 380 gigawatt, uh, which uh, Goa um, is setting as a target, and not for the countries in Goa to install, but to drive the installment off globally, also working with other partners. And uh, to put that into perspective, that is a six-fold increase of the total offshore wind capacity in just seven years. That is a major undertaking. Uh, and there's a second goal, which is to uh, reach 2,000 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2050. That is what uh, IRENA uh, thinks should be the contribution of wind, offshore wind to the global energy mix for us to stay on a 1.5 degree pathway. Um, 2,000 gigawatts is two times the present power generation capacity of the entire United States. So that is a very ambitious target. Um, uh, there was a reference made to the 20 years that we've been going at it. Actually, in Denmark, we built the first offshore wind farm in the world 31 years ago. We've already decommissioned it. And, and we know how long it takes to, to, build, um, to build that kind of, uh, of capacity. Uh, and, and therefore, bringing together both the, um, the ambitious governments, industry, hopefully also finance um, into one coalition around one, um, one table to, to aggregate and generate uh, speed and scale on offshore wind is really the ambition of this, of this alliance. So um, we are in it for the long haul. We are building a better future together. And uh, as uh, Dan Jorgensen, if he had been here, uh, would have said, uh, let's be the wind of change that is needed. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pass over now to um, uh, Her Excellency Minister um, Velis Torres. Um, please, you can, you can stay seated if you, if, you, if you prefer. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for having me here. My name is Irene Velis Torres, Colombia's Minister of Energy and Mine, and I am going to talk a bit about my country's recent developments in wind power and our commitment to renewable energy energies and a renewable future. I would like to thank the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, Mr. Francesco here, the CEO of the Global Wind Energy Council, Mr. Ben Blackwell, the Climate Ambassador of Denmark, Mr. Thomas Anker Christensen, and all the representatives of the industry, as well as delegations of the countries that are joining us here today. I am really excited about sharing our ambitious goals in just energy transition during the next uh, launch of the Global Offshore Wind Alliance. This is a necessary alliance during times of economic recovery and global energy crisis. When we need to make the best use of our energy resources, 
where offshore wind hold the largest clean energy potential in our northern coast, we see this alliance as a best opportunity to move forward our agenda in energy transition. In terms of wind, Colombian Caribbean coast, particularly the northern coast of La Guajira, has been recognized as one of the areas with best wind energy potential in the continent. Average speed is almost twice as the global average and has been even compared with energy powerhouses like Denmark and the Netherlands. It is important, however, to adopt offshore wind power in an inclusive way. These areas are inhabited by ethnic communities that deserve to make part of every project that takes place in their scarred territories. It is important then to benefit communities that have the right to continue living in their territories and have access to the uh, incomes and the profit and the benefits that is coming with these renewables. That is why we believe that joining this alliance will allow us to facilitate an open dialogue as well as to foster international collaboration based on mutual respect, seeking benefits for all. This can be achieved by using a strategy where the best offshore wind technologies for Colombian conditions can be implemented in collaboration with local professionals and educational institutions to facilitate an effective knowledge transfer that will help our country operate these technologies, but even more to make sure that our country's peoples and our institutions can also develop technologies using and improving local capacities. This is the just energy transition we are looking for, an energy transition based on knowledge, local development, where everyone can take part, where uh, helping also uh, our government to shape a fossil fuel a free future for next generations. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. I'm, I'm going to go to um, Ali Zaidi, if I may, um, from, from the US first, and, and uh, before I go to, uh, to Jennifer, if that's OK, um, as he has a, a, a schedule. Thanks so much, um, and, and apologies for having to leave a little bit early here. Um, we are so grateful to have a chance to be here uh, as part of the founding of this critical alliance. Um, for the United States, we really see tremendous opportunity embedded in offshore wind. And it's opportunity that stretches far beyond our coastlines. Um, so we have, as a Biden administration, now opened up offshore wind leasing on the East Coast and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, on the West Coast, in the Pacific Ocean, and off the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we are issuing leases all in aim of delivering 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Uh, you rewind the tape three or four years, I don't think anyone would have guessed where we are today. Um, what's so powerful for us, though, is, again, not just the opportunity for the coast, but for our entire country. Um, one, we think about the opportunity for our workforce. So we're lucky to have Orsted here, uh, who has led a really path-breaking partnership in the United States with our building trades unions, uh, making sure that the work that's done is done under a collective bargaining agreement, that these are jobs that help build up the middle class uh, all across the United States, which, by the way, boosts the political economy around offshore wind. The second place where we think offshore wind is tremendous opportunity is in communities that have seen economic decline and disinvestment over the last many years. Um, yeah, that's the port communities. Those ports that had maybe been shuttered are now turning back on. Maybe they will be staging locations. Maybe they will be places where there's interconnection into the grid. But there's also investment that we're seeing in steel factories. Uh, in places that are building monopiles, um, there is investment across a broad supply chain, and we're being able to harness that for our economy, which, again, boosts the political economy of clean energy and offshore wind. Um, we are seeing the transformation take place in a way that lifts up communities that have been oppressed by dirty energy, right? Folks breathing in 
particulate matter and local uh, pollution um, are now going to have a chance to breathe in cleaner air. That's a boon for public health. It's a boon for our kids and our young people. So look, the president looks out at this uh, opportunity. He's made an investment through the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law in deploying the wind. He's created a tax credit for manufacturing the parts. Through his infrastructure law, he's investing in the ports. He's made a historic investment in the grid. And bottom line is this. This is tremendous opportunity, as folks have already said, to decarbonize and deliver power at a scale and speed that we're going to need for every sector of our economy. What's so big about offshore wind, and by the way, we've got a research uh, thrust going on floating uh, wind turbines, uh, which will be critical for California. But the big thing, as we see it, is this is not just another source of variable power. The wind blows a lot offshore. And so as we think about our decarbonization toolkit, this is actually a differentiated and powerful product. So we're excited about the steel, we're excited about the cement, we're excited about the technology, we're excited for our workers and our communities, we're excited for the partnership of these countries and for industry and labor all coming together to turbocharge us in the direction of cleaner energy and a cleaner economy. And we're grateful to be part of uh, this new organization. Thank you. Great. I'm going I'm to pass it on without further ado to, to uh, Jennifer Morgan. We are um, slightly time constrained in this, in this room, so gonna, let's, let's move on. So I'll get right down to it. Um, you know, very much first want to say a thank you um, to Francesco, to Thomas, to Ben, to, to, the, to those of you who have made all of this possible. We're incredibly happy to be part of this, um, and I know it wouldn't happen uh, without you. Um, and look, I mean, there's a saying in German, wenn nicht jetzt, wann dann? That means, if not now, then when? We know the gaps. We know that we need to move away from just incremental change into transformation. And these goals that are being set and looking syst systemically at the challenges that it that it uh, that will come that are coming already. I can experience. I can speak from our own experience of scaling up um, um, offshore wind and onshore wind. That we work th through those together so that we can accelerate the pace um, of learning uh, and also find the solutions to the various um, challenges that come, whether they be the balance between environmental. Uh, and climate and energy goals, whether they be the balance and bringing in the social um, issues of labor that are there, um, and and wh or whether it be kind of where do we go? You know, where are those places that we can we can be placing uh, these turbines? Certainly, for us, uh, it is also coming at a time of a Russian war of aggression where we are phasing out, have phased out um, uh, Russian fossil fuels and plan to phase out all uh, fossil fuels for our climate neutrality goal by 2045. So we're at eight gigawatts of installed offshore wind capacity now. Um, Germany after China and the UK is the biggest offshore wind capacity owner globally. We're going also to, by 2030, 30 gigawatts of offshore capacity and at least 70 um, by 2045. And I think the other piece that for us beyond the domestic benefits that come and also, you know, looking at how we build up the, the, the workforce and the training for the engineers that need to also come forward is also how we can work with partners in other countries, uh, just energy transition partnerships, but not only. We are ready and want to work on eye level uh, with countries to share the experience we've had, to share the lessons that we've had so that we can move this uh, to where it needs to be in order to keep the 1.5 degree goal within sight, and we're very pleased and honored to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jaime, your Royal, your Royal Highness, please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, again, also, Francesco, Thomas, uh, Ben, uh, congratulations with this initiative. And when we heard it, uh, you look at the Netherlands and you think um, 
wind, windmills and that's a typical thing, but uh, we kind of left it behind and then we're finally catching up also on, uh, on modern, modern, uh, modern windmills, which, which is the, the turbines. Um, no, it's good, good to be here. Um, Francesco already said wind energy is the most effective uh, solution um, and we see that in the Netherlands. A big challenge that we have is space, so offshore is the solution uh, to go forward. Um, in the North Sea, we already envisioned 21 gigawatt offshore wind capacity by 2030. So we heard, we heard the US at 21. Uh, we heard uh, also 30, 30, uh, 31, 30, and, uh, and we're 21. And we focus on 70 gigawatts by 2050. So very much on par what uh, Germany is aiming for as well. Um, and we to, hope to develop energy systems with other countries, prioritizing integrated and balanced solutions for three transitions at the same time. Of course, energy, which we're discussing here, but also nature and food. And we have an innovative tendering uh, process where we put ecological conditions and, uh, and, and companies will have to uh, come with solutions and compete on ecology to have the tender um, 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 go their way. And we just discussed it as well that uh, there was quite a new way of, uh, of approaching this going forward. Uh, we believe that these transitions go hand in hand. Uh, and build uh, integrated uh, solutions uh, together. So for these ends, we believe we can benefit from international cooperation and knowledge sharing, which is why we, share, we join this first mover alliance of offshore wind energy. Thank you very much. Um, Hans Olaf. Thank you very much. Uh, let me also state that we welcome uh, GOVA. We fully support the objectives, uh, which are also fully aligned with our own ambitions uh, from the Norwegian government side. We have an ambition to open up areas for wind power, power production with a planned capacity of 30 gigawatts by 2040. We will be also putting the first uh, floating uh, wind power plant in operation later this year. The high wind uh, Tampen project is a small one, but it's a start. So this is an, an area that we would like to develop further. From the Norwegian side, we will build on our long uh, experience from offshore oil and gas and maritime and then uh, focus on developing floating offshore wind. But when we're opening up the areas, it will be bottom uh, wind as well as uh, floating. So we have the industrial uh, experience um, and we also have lots of good wind potential in Norway, especially when you go a little bit further north. So Norway is a stable, reliable energy provider to Europe these days. We have, of course, increased our gas production to offset some of the, the Russian shortfall in gas to Europe. And we also intend to be a stable wind producer and wind supplier to Europe uh, to help in the energy transition that we all need to embark upon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mads Nipper from Austin, please. Thank you very much, <clears throat> and let me also just say that we really, really celebrate and, and applaud the initiative, and we are happy and proud to be a partner of this initiative. So 31 years <clears throat> when we uh, decided to put turbines at sea, everybody laughed and said that's going to be a joke, it'll never be scalable. And now 31 years later, we just commissioned the, one, the world's largest offshore wind farm again, which powers 1.4 million uh, British homes. 1.3 gigawatt wind farm off the, the east coast. And by the way, as, uh, as <clears throat> Francisco said, uh, this is, uh, we, offshore wind power is, depending on what start you use, is now 50 to 70 percent cheaper than it was, and a fraction of the cheapest fossil fuel energy source for electricity. So hard to find any arguments against scaling. And there are even more <clears throat> arguments for. As my um, friend here uh, next to me said for the US, when you look at communities where offshore wind now, whether it is uh, the offshore wind supply chain which creates good paying jobs in 40, 40 American states, not just the east and west coast, but really bipartisan across all kinds of states. When I look at, at, at what was once a thriving fishing community at the east coast of the UK with Hull and Grimsby, which is what essentially was a dying community, which is now invigorating through new jobs and through lots of economic activity. Those are wonderful examples of jobs, economic activity, local benefits, and now even with new investments from our side also into biodiversity being restored in areas that were threatened by that. Being a partner is also being honest. And we promised to be, we promised to be honest in this for better or worse, 
So we will celebrate and happily share the good experiences, but we will also be ruthlessly honest with what doesn't work. Uh, and that is very, very important because most things work in offshore, but not everything. <clears throat> and uh, and just to mention one example, today in almost all countries it takes longer to have a permitted site offshore than it does to actually build the site. That is unacceptable, friends. And we must share good experiences like in Denmark where there's a one-shop stop uh, in order to have somebody coordinate and speed up those approvals. Otherwise, we'll never be in time for neither 2030 or 2050. We also need to how to balance the benefits of just cheaper power with societal benefits, including also doing an impact with nature in a time where, where capex inflation and cost of capital only goes one way and that's up. How do we ensure we get all of that right? And we promise we will make all and honest contributions to the Alliance. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mads. Uh, the hard work uh, begins with Goa, and uh, we will also have a, a formal launch um, of the Alliance with a slightly more uh, relaxed setting um, at the IRENA Pavilion uh, uh, next week, where we'll have more time to engage with, with stakeholders and, and, and other uh, uh, parties as well, and other countries will be joining uh, that event as well. Um, if there are members of the press here who'd like to talk, we are uh, going to be um, ejected from this room, but please stay and talk um, to any of the ministers, officials, or industry people who will be able to stick around for a few minutes. Um, we also um, have other industry uh, representatives and investors as well. Um, Jonathan Cole, the CEO of um, Corio Generation, was held up, unfortunately, but has arrived as well. So welcome, uh, Jonathan. We have representatives also from Mainstream, from Arca, um, and other companies as well. So please uh, stick around and talk. Thank you very, very much for attending this, and um, we're looking forward to working with you all.